I can't imagine. They must have spent a huge <laughs> amount of resources in, in merging things and then unmerging things. Wow. Yeah, I hope this doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's different, in the case of, of Rutgers and the medical school, for example, the cultures are very different, right? Um, so I don't know how that's going to work. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know how that's going to work. Um, we'll see. We have some. Yeah, and, and there are more who want to join, but... And and some people when they were there they you know maybe geared towards less sort of fundamental stuff or less academic I don't know, people have some restrictions against some of them, you know. They want don't want them to join if they're not sort of academic enough, I guess. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, near Princeton. Yeah, the next town over. Yeah, no, it's 30 minutes. It's my max. I, I, I can't commute longer than 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Princeton is really nice. Uh, that's not as nice, is it? Well, no, Princeton is, yeah, top. Yeah. Yeah. The good thing too is that it's sort of in the middle between uh, New York City and Philadelphia. Right? Yeah. We'll do. Yep. Sit down. Thanks, Fred. Thanks for uh, inviting me, and thank you all for coming. Uh, like Fred said, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this work that we've been doing on leveraging renewable energy in data centers. Uh, this is a project that's going on at Rutgers. Uh, here are some of my uh, collaborators. And there are a couple of people there from UPC Barcelona. Uh, so before I, I go into uh, more details here, uh, let me mention that our ultimate goal is really to look at computing in general at all levels, not just data centers. But data centers happen to be the things that we understand best right now. So, but, but later on, we want to broaden the scope to you know, mobile devices and so on and, and understand how they can adapt to renewable energy. Okay? So here's an outline of uh, my talk. Um, I'll start with the motivation for why we're doing this work in terms of 
uh, data center energy usage and the carbon footprint of data centers. Uh, then I'll talk about four different approaches out of the many approaches uh, out there for uh, reducing carbon emissions, the carbon emissions of data centers using renewables. Uh, and I'll discuss the pros and cons of each approach and then uh, I'll describe our approach, which is one of those, those four. Uh, and the research challenges involved in, in the approach that we decided to take. After that, uh, I'll describe the hardware and software that we're building to try and address those research uh, issues, those research questions. So the first being Parasol, our, uh, the, you know, uh, micro data center, solar powered micro data center that we're building that Fred mentioned. Uh, that's the hardware part. Then we'll talk about the, the systems that we're building for leveraging solar energy in systems like Parasol. And then I'll talk about some of our uh, current and future works and then conclude the talk. Uh, I'd like to do this very informally. So if, if you guys have questions, you know, feel free to stop me and, and ask them. I'll be more than happy to, uh, to answer questions as we go along. So here's motivation. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, the, the key driving force here is the fact that data centers consume a large amount of, of energy. And let me define data centers first. Uh, here I'm talking about installations ranging from little machine rooms that we have in uh, any university, at many companies, all the way to giant custom-built warehouse-sized installations like those that Google runs or Microsoft or Amazon. So, so we're talking about maybe a few dozen machines all the way to thousands of machines uh, in the same installation. And it turns out, as uh, we'll discuss here, that uh, most of the electricity that data centers consume does not go into these massive uh, data centers. It's actually in the small and medium-sized data centers out there. So here are two figures showing you, uh, sort of trying to quantify the amount of electricity that data centers consume uh, on the left side, in terms of United, uh, data centers in the United States, on the right side, uh, those are worldwide data centers, okay? Um, and you may have seen some of this, uh, you know, the 2000 and 2005 data. Uh, this is billion kilowatt hours per year. Um, and you may have seen the 2000 2005 data in a report that the EPA put out in 2006. Uh, and the result of that showed that from 2000 to 2005, the electricity consumption of data centers actually doubled. And the EPA was proposing or, or was predicting that uh, that amount of energy would double again until 2010. Uh, it turns out that this did not happen. You can see here it's an increase of only 36% as opposed to 100%. And uh, what happened in the middle here that caused this slow down in the increase is the popularity of, of virtualization, but more importantly, a great, great recession, right? That caused this here. And the trend for worldwide data centers was the same, that you know, their electricity consumption would double in five years, and it was actually much lower than that, just 56%. Yes? Yes. Right. The methodology that people use basically is in terms of how many servers are sold. Right. And then they, based on estimations of how much energy each server consumes during their lifetimes, then they extrapolate to, to come up with this. That's, that's why they can't really separate out, you know, machine rooms from slightly larger installations all the way to giant data centers. Right. So, so they go by the sale of, of servers. Server equipment. Right. Yes. Which is the case, right? You don't normally see people sort of turning off servers. And, and servers are very, very non-energy proportional, meaning that they 
consume almost their peak uh, uh, energy or the peak, their peak power even when they're idle. So, so let's say they're, they're pretty accurate. Yeah. And, and the multiple sources sort of agree with that type of methodology. So I think there's a general consensus that this, let me put it this way, it's very difficult to say how accurate it is. But in terms of what can be done, this is, I think, the best we can do. So to, to put these, these uh, in perspective, uh, this amount of energy here, roughly 60 billion kilowatt hours per year, uh, this is more than the entire transportation manufacturing industry consumes in terms of electricity. That's the industry that makes ships, cars, uh, trains, all of that stuff. Okay, so this is a lot of electricity. Uh, this here, the, the 2010 bar, is about 2% of the electricity consumed in the US. And this 2010 bar for the rest of the world is about 1.3% of the total electricity consumed in the world, just out of these server installations. And as you can see, this is still going at a pretty steep pace when we get out of the recession, technically we have gotten out of the recession, but when we start growing significantly again, uh, then you see these numbers grow up pretty quickly. So, but the, the problem is not just that, right? This, the, the real problem is that all of this energy that gets consumed is mostly produced by carbon intensive means. What I mean by that is that uh, this electricity that gets consumed by all of these servers actually comes from burning natural gas, burning coal, okay? So here, what I'm showing you on the left is a couple of bars for the electricity sources for United States uh, electricity consumption and worldwide electricity consumption. Broken down into uh, coal, natural gas, nuclear, renewables, uh, which in this case is including hydro and others. So you can see that for both the US and the world, at least 60% of the electricity consumed uh, comes from uh, burning natural gas and coal, right? So these are very, as I'll show you in a, in a graph later, these are very carbon intensive means of, of producing electricity. So the, 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 the figure on the right is actually very interesting. So the figure on the right, what it does is it takes all of the data centers in the world and just the data centers and make them into a country com comprised simply of data centers. And then it compares that data center country to actual countries in terms of their carbon emissions. And the figure here shows uh, carbon emissions in uh, millions of metric tons per year. And as you can see, this data center country actually becomes the 35th country out of the more than 200 countries we have in the world today, the data center country would be 35th in the world in terms of carbon emissions, right, between um, the Czech Republic and Nigeria. Um, so, so that's a lot of carbon. Um, and what we'd like to do is start thinking about how we can uh, use renewables to reduce this carbon footprint or to mitigate it somehow. Okay, so it turns out that there are many ways that uh, people have come up with to try and either offset their, uh, their carbon emissions or um, replace these fuel intensive, uh, these uh, carbon intensive means of electricity production with other types of production. So here I'll talk about four different approaches and the pros and cons of those approaches. So let's start with the fun. Uh, first is compensation approaches, where we use carbon offsets to compensate for brown energy use. So you can think of um, this type of compensation with carbon offsets may be something like, well, I consume uh, brown energy or energy produced by carbon intensive means and then I compensate, I offset that consumption by planting trees somewhere in Eastern Europe, okay? Uh, so the pros and cons there, 
so in terms of pro, uh, pros, a data center operator that would take this approach to compensate for its carbon emissions wouldn't have to worry about renewable energy at all, right? You wouldn't have to worry about building uh, solar farms or anything like that. Uh, and this, uh, at the same time, this would encourage me to conserve energy in the sense that if I conserve energy, then I, can, I have to purchase fewer offsets, then my cost is going to be low. However, uh, as I gave the example of these offsets where you consume brown energy here, say, and then we offset by planting trees in, in Eastern Europe, is not very good, right? Because we get stuck with the coal mining and the fracking, and they get the nice trees over there. So, so that's sometimes because of this gap, people have, this, have criticized this approach. And another problem is that offsets are an extra cost for businesses. So people have actually uh, taken this approach. Uh, in the UK, starting in April 2010, the UK decided that any business that consumes more than six gigawatt hours per year would have to participate in a cap and trade scheme by which any consumption above that limit would have to be offset uh, by those, those businesses. So this is being used out there as, as one particular approach. Another approach is what I call the grid-centric approach. And the grid-centric approach, the idea is to build renewable uh, uh, infrastructures that produce renewable electricity and pump the electricity into the grid. And people who uh, consume electricity, they'll consume it directly from the grid, so they won't know where the, or in fact, they won't care where the electricity is going to come from, but there's some fraction of electricity that's coming from those types of sources. So there, there are advantages and disadvantages here as well. Uh, in terms of advantages, uh, whenever the grid is available, you can, you, you have electricity, right? Your power is always going to be there. So there are no issues with, you know, the fact that solar energy, for example, is not constantly available, right? At night, you don't generate solar energy, right? So because, but because we're pumping renewable electricity into the grid, then consumers don't see those effects. Uh, another advantage is that the, the data center operator does not have to operate those plants, does, doesn't have to operate the production of, these, uh, of the renewable energy. Now, in terms of, oh, and another important one is that the plants can then be placed at the best locations for the electricity that they're producing. So, for example, if we want to produce wind uh, power, then we'll place wind turbines at the best possible location, most likely offshore somewhere, pump the electricity that gets produced there into the grid, and everybody can, can use it. Uh, and what this means is that you don't have to co-locate your data center with the, the turbines or the, the production of the electricity. The problem, though, is this you would think that this approach is really nice. The problem is that when you produce electricity some far, someplace far away and you have to transmit it to other places, there are losses in that process with both transmission and transforming the electricity in terms of the voltage uh, and, and the type of electricity, AC and DC. So there are losses there that can go up to 40%. Another uh, disadvantage of this approach is that some technologies are not very scalable. Take solar, for example. Solar, you can't benef really benefit from economies of scale in solar because the size of the largest inverter is limited. You can only go to like 800 kilowatt inverters. And so if you want to go beyond that, then you need multiple of these. So it doesn't, the, the cost doesn't go down from that point. And, and finally, another disadvantage is that data centers that depend on the grid depend on the grid. So if the grid is out for some reason or, um, you know, uh, there's some, um, 
what's the name of this that they, they you guys had here? Roll, um, rolling blackouts, rolling blackouts and, and things like that, then you're out of luck. You can't run anything. And this is actually common in countries like India, right, where the power is not there all the time. So if you depend on this type of approach, you won't be able to compute during certain times. An example of, of this type of approach is, is what Google does, right? So Google, what Google does is it purchases um, wind power, for example, from Nextera, from these wind farms that Nextera has in the, the middle of the country, and then resells that energy to utilities in exchange for renewable energy credits. Right, so Google had to become an energy company to be able to do this, to, to buy cheap electricity and then resell it. Um, and the idea here is the same. Right? Google is going to use whatever electricity comes from the grid, but it's pumping in wind power into the grid somewhere else. There are also co-location approaches where you place your data center near a, a, an already existing uh, renewable energy plant, right? Um, here you can reduce the, the losses because now you're not going to trans power over long distances uh, and there no, there's no dependence on the grid because your connection to the plant can be direct. Uh, but there are disadvantages too, right? The location may not be great for a data center, right? Like we said before. And the power of the plant may have already been committed. We actually saw that effect in, at Rutgers. Rutgers has a solar farm, and we wanted to build our data center to draw from the solar farm. But it turns out that all the electricity the solar farm produces is already spoken for. So we can, we can, we can do that. So an example of this approach is, is uh, Microsoft building data centers near hydro plants in the Columbia River, right, in, in Oregon. Finally, the, the last approach that I wanted to mention is distributed generation, uh, distributed generation, where the data center operator would build its own renewable plant. Uh, this, again, reduces energy losses because the connection to the plant is direct. Uh, it allows the, op the data center to operate even during periods of grid outages. And the capital costs of building the installation can be recovered later on for lower, overall lower electricity costs, right? Because after you, you've amortized capital cost of building the plant, then electricity is cost free for you. Unfortunately, though, uh, there are problems here too. Now that the DC operator has to worry about renewable plants, right? So unless they hire somebody to take care of the renewable plant, then they have to worry about maintaining the plant and, and so on. And the best place, like I mentioned before, the best place for the plant may not be the best place for the data center, right? So Apple is a good example of this, this approach. Uh, Apple is building a 20 megawatt solar array for its data center in North Carolina. Uh, in fact, McGraw-Hill is doing uh, the same. It's building a 14 megawatt solar array for its data center actually near my house, just in New Jersey, um, a couple of minutes from my, my place. Here, you're actually building the solar plant yourself. You're going to operate it yourself because an existing power plant may have already uh, uh, assigned all of its electricity to other purposes. It's similar. It's similar. It reduces the energy losses with power transmission. Right. I'm actually surprised Apple is doing this. I didn't think that these extremely large data centers would actually, uh, uh, that the companies wouldn't want to power their, those extremely large data centers with solar or, 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 or other renewable approaches because of the amount of space that that takes. And I'll, I'll mention a couple of uh, data points later on um, in terms of the amount of space. Okay, so it turns out that we actually use this last approach. We, we argue for this last approach 
uh, even though we do realize that there are disadvantages, disadvantages to it. Uh, so let's talk about our approach now and, and the research challenge that comes along with it. Um, so we argue for self-generation with solar and wind. Um, and we focus more, like I, like I said before, on small and medium data centers. The, the problem with uh, using those kinds of technologies for very large data centers is the amount of space that you require. So you end up paying a lot of money in terms of land that you have to purchase to be able to put the, the installation. So I, I did some calculations. And if you think of a fully uh, uh, a rack that's fully popul populated with servers that consume 200 watts, one new servers that consume 200 watts, the amount of solar, the amount of space that you need for your solar farm is essentially 80 times larger than the area of that one rack. So for every rack, you need 80 times the space of that rack for solar panels. The, the types of, of servers that we use reduce this space to just a fourth of that, uh, 20 times. But still, it's, it's a significant amount of, of, amount of area. That's the reason why we like this type of approach for smaller data centers, uh, small and medium sized, which actually respond for the vast majority of the electricity consumed by data centers. F for you to give you, a, for, for me to give you a sense for, uh, for, for that observation that I just made, if people have estimated that the entire computational infrastructure that Google runs, and that's estimated to be one million servers, consumes, consumes less than 1% of the electricity consumed by data centers in the world. Right? So the largest computer installation in the world consumes less than 1% of what data centers consume worldwide. Uh, I don't. I, I don't have that data. I think that people who have tried to come up with those numbers, it's much harder to come up with those numbers accurately. Uh, so, so I don't know what the number is. Um, so servers is 1.5% of the entire... Is one so so one point five excludes the data center. That's right. Just okay. So yeah. it's, it's often worth electricity plus another one kilometer yeah. per cent of the data consumption. I was gonna ask um when you did that area calculation for the server rack, yeah. did you include the dedicated rack to the rack or just the data center? No, just just the, the server rack yeah. itself. In our container, is, it's not a whole lot of space. Yeah. Uh, but typically, that, that's a good question. Uh, if, if you add the extra space, maybe it would triple the area yeah. at most. So we're still talking you know, a, lot. a lot, right? Yes, I, I'll show you what we use. We use free cooling, actually. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get there. So, so with, with small and medium data centers, you, you get smaller capital costs, smaller installations, a smaller amount of land, and it's much easier to install and maintain these, these installations, right? So, so why solar and wind uh, as opposed to other types of, uh, of renewables? Um, so here's a, here's a figure that shows the number of grams of carbon, off, um, carbon dioxide equivalent per kilowatt hour over the lifetime of the source of, of power. So here we got coal on one end and oil, diesel, natural gas. Those are the big you know, producers of carbon. 
And then we got all of these other ones, starting with nuclear all the way to offshore wind. So a lot of people ask, oh, why not, why not nuclear, right? Well, the thing with, with nuclear or hydro, the, the thing with, with nuclear is that nuclear waste actually lasts for thousands of years. And you'd be hard pressed to find anybody who's willing to store the nuclear waste. Uh, and in fact, even Nevada, which had said that they, were, they would store the nuclear waste from uh, the US facilities is, has backed out of, of the deal. Uh, so so that's, that's, a big, that's a big one there. Uh, hydro has other issues. Hydro has a huge environmental disruption because of the lake that it has to create. And in fact, uh, because of the degradation of the vegetation where the lake gets created, there's a lot of carbon emissions from there. This is all lifetime, right? So this includes the production of the geothermal equipment and all of that, right? So, so you see solar PV here, it's different than zero. You'd say, why? Well, it's, that's the reason, right? In, in producing solar panels, you produce carbon dioxide equivalent. And, and for you guys who may, may not be familiar with carbon dioxide equivalent, all this doing is trying to bring all of the greenhouse, greenhouse, greenhouse gases and, and sort of quantify them as, in, uh, normalize them to carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide has, is not as bad for the environment as other gases, but there's so much more of it that we keep talking about carbon dioxide. But in reality, methane, for example, has 20 times more impact on the environment than, uh, than carbon dioxide. So solar and wind are clean, yeah? So space is just space is useless, mm -hmm. including co-location, maybe a better approach in terms of the multi grid in terms of space learning, but what about your technology, is it depend on the... No, no, it doesn't. Electricity and solar is built in space. Yes, uh, it, it's just that the platform that we built to study these issues is a self-generation platform. Well, well not Rutgers. <coughs> the parasol is, yeah. So here's a two um, figures showing the availability of, of solar and wind across the US. Uh, you can see, sorry, you can't read the legends here. I apologize for that. Uh, so, so the, the blue means good wind. Uh, so it's superb, outstanding, excellent, good and fair. <laughs> it's a lot of uh, big words there. But, uh, but you can see that most of the wind is available offshore, right, on the two sides of the country. And in the middle here, it's, it's OK. But there are locations for, like, for example, New Jersey, uh, that are very bad in terms of wind. Solar is much more available uh, in the US. So you can see over here in the desert, a lot of solar there. So, so red means good solar. And this color, whatever this color is, is bad. <laughs> uh, New Jersey is OK over there. <laughs> it's not great. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not, uh, I wish there was some red over here, but. Right. But uh, it's definitely not as bad as uh, you know, Seattle over there. But in any case, uh, so, so we can see that, at least for the US, uh, solar is, is more widely available. So we're focusing a lot on, on solar. Uh, and f let me give you a, a, a sense. Yeah. Well, offshore here, and, and, and this is good. Pink is good. Oh, that's the Texas up there? Yeah, that's the Texas. Um, Isn't it? Texas actually has the yeah, mountains. that's Texas. I, I thought so. Yeah. <laughs> um, because Texas actually has the largest amount of wind insulation in the West, right? So but is it, is it offshore? It, it's both. Because so offshore here, there's, it's this is pretty good. 
Um, and, and here's good, okay. a good amount of wind. Um, I should have put the, the sort of these um, in there. I'll, I don't remember offhand, but uh, I'll put it in for next time, I guess. Um, so we're focusing on solar a lot. And uh, then the, the next thing you think about, well, what about cost, right? Isn't solar super expensive and so on? Well, it is. Uh, so these two figures give you a sense for the prices of, of um, uh, photovoltaic panels uh, over time from 1980 to 2010, 2011. You can see that uh, prices have come down a factor of 10 during that period of, of 30 years. Um, and, and here, so, so these data are shown in um, 2011 dollars. So we took the, the amount that they cost and we normalized everything to 2011. So you can see that the average national, uh, national cost for electricity is roughly stable around uh, 10 cents per kilowatt hour. And over here, the cost of solar per watt uh, has gone down significantly. And so you look at this number here, this is about $2.5 per watt. And you say, well, that's, that's reasonable, you know. But how does it translate? Well, the, the problem is that solar installations are not just the panels, right? You need inverters, uh, you need other equipment. So when you put the inverters in, and we did the calculations for our system, then we go up to about roughly five watts, uh, five dollars per watt in, in New Jersey. That's for provisioning that, right? But then the other side is that that time? No, th this, is, this is AC watts, not DC watts, right? So the solar array produces DC, and then you've got to invert it to, yeah. to AC, and then there's a loss there. But then the, is this already kind of like the lifetime of the panel, or is this, mm -mm. this is the cost of provisioning the This is the capital cost how much it costs to put it there right. and, and install it. Yeah, this, this, then you can use this information here to do then a calculation of how long it would take you to amortize that cost. Uh, it's a long time. <laughs> uh, it, I'll tell you the number after I, <laughs> so, 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 so this goes up to, to $5 per watt. Uh, but it turns out, though, that the federal government and uh, the states, roughly, I think all the states, have pretty um, generous incentives for people to build these installations. So the cost in New Jersey, those incentives get up to 60% of the cost. So with that, then the cost comes roughly $2 uh, per watt. And I did the calculations, assuming, you know, the amount of, electricity that a solar farm produces as a, fact, as a fraction of the max and all of that stuff. Considering all of it, it takes 10 years to, to amortize, which is not bad given that the, the lifetime of the solar panels is uh, between 20 and 30 years. And so even if your data center gets phased out, you can reuse the installation for other things or you can pop the electricity back to the grid and, and get money from there. But this, this, these calculations here do not include labor, though. Labor is massive, and we don't know what the final labor bill is going to be. Uh, so we're going to have to revise this, uh, these calculations. Yes. Right. And the whole problem here, the reason why it takes that long, is that in New Jersey, a solar farm produces only 16% of the maximum energy that it can produce, right? Because it's not sunny constantly, right? The nights and the you know, cloudy days and, and stuff like that. So, so you, can only, you can only get 16% of the maximum. For other places, like the red areas there, you can get up to much higher than that. And all of this, uh, any more than you can get from 16, you're going to reduce the amortization time. Right? 
The main challenge, though, and, and this is the reason why there's research here, is that solar and, and wind are not always there. Right? Typically, you, you know, build your data center, you take your servers, you connect them to the, the electrical outlet, and you assume the electricity is going to be there. Right? But if you want to promote green energy and use green energy as much as you can, instead of run, using brown energy that's got a high um, carbon footprint or uh, high carbon emissions, then you've got to worry about it now. Right? You're saying, oh, it's a night. Green energy is not being generated. Maybe I don't want to run my computations now. Maybe I want to wait until the morning or something like that. Right? So now we're talking about how do we match the energy demand, that is, our need to do computation, to a variable supply of energy. Right? So we're trying to match demand and supply. Then there are many research questions that come up. Right? What types of data center workloads are amenable to this type of, of, of scenario where you, know, you may have to delay things or you may have to degrade quality when green energy is not available? Right? Uh, what kinds of techniques can we apply? You know, delaying is an obvious one. Degrading quality is, an, uh, is another one. Can we do other things? What other things can we do? And in order to be able to make decisions, we have to be able to predict the availability of green energy with s some level of accuracy. How accurate can we make this? What, what types of techniques do we use to be able to predict the availability of solar? So based on these questions and, and this um, overall challenge of trying to match energy demand to energy supply, we're building both hardware and software to be able to address this challenge and answer these questions. Yeah? Could you talk a bit more about these mitigation approaches? I mean, I realize that all of them are like in, in sort of energy storage includes energy losses again, but the advantage would be that the solution is more generic, right? Right. So, so, so what's, what's the main? Yeah, so, so the main problems with, with batteries are the following, right? So as you mentioned, there are energy losses in batteries, right? The amount that you can draw from batteries is less than the amount that you put in, right? So there's a percentage that goes right there. Another problem with batteries is that they're very expensive, right? So it's not uncommon for batteries to represent the largest fraction of the cost of a solar installation. The third reason is that the chemicals that are used in batteries are hardly uh, harmful to the environment. So it, right, if you could avoid using them, it's a good thing. Uh, the other one is net metering. Net metering, basically for you who don't know this terminology, the idea of net metering is you produce some electricity, you pump it into the grid for credit. Right? It turns out that there are losses there, right? because you have to convert, yeah, you may, you may reach some large number like 40% because of the transformations to the power. Uh, you have uh, <coughs> net metering is not available everywhere. And even when it is available, sometimes the utility will pay you less money for electricity that you put in than the amount that you pay when electricity comes out. So there are disadvantages there. So if we can make computing adapt to a variable supply of power in such a way that doesn't hurt us, doesn't hurt our business uh, goals and so on, that is the best approach. It doesn't have all of these uh, deficiencies. So this is what we want to study. How far can we push this? So now I'm going to talk about the hardware part of our story here, uh, which is called Parasol or Solar Micro Data Center. So we built uh, Parasol as a research platform. Right? We're not necessarily arguing that the way you want to build these types of installations is the way we built Parasol. In fact, we're putting, we put in batteries to be able to study batteries. Uh, but we don't argue that you know, we, we should, people in general should be doing this. So the research platform allows us to study solar-powered computing, to uh, uh, create software and study software that allows us to exploit renewables both within data centers and across data centers. 
and to study the trade-offs between using net metering, use batteries, use uh, renewables directly. So those are the three main goals for Parasol. But given that we were building the system, we said we might as well build other interesting things into it so that we can broaden the scope of the research that we can do with it. So another thing that we do uh, with Parasol is free cooling. So for those of you who are not familiar with free cooling, the idea is to bring uh, air from outside the container uh, and, and blow the air to the front of the machines and exhaust the air on the other side. Right? So this is quite different than what is normally done with compressor-based air conditioning, right? where there's no air coming from the outside. Um, and it turns out that in New Jersey, we expect to be able to use free cooling essentially um, roughly 330, 340 days of the year. Uh, so we have a system that switches from free cooling to standard air conditioning if the temperature exceeds a preset value. Another thing we're, that we're going to study is highly efficient uh, servers based on Atom, the Atom processor from, from Intel. Um, and we're going to study solid state drives too. All the servers include solid state drives. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Th that's actually part of the study, right? We want to make sure that reality matches the claims of the, of the uh, free cooling manufacturer. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'll show you data about power consumption in a minute. Right here. So we put Parasol on the roof of not our, our building, our neighbor, neighboring building. <laughs> not because we just didn't have room on our roof. It, it's not like, you know, let's not mess up our roof. Let's mess up somebody else's roof. Uh, so, so here's uh, a Google Maps uh, picture of the roof. This is it with the, I don't know if you can see this very well from, from afar. So, so, so there's a metal frame and there's a container. This uh, beige thing is the parasol container. Uh, what you see here is the air conditioning unit. The free cooling unit is on the other side. And this is the exhaust for the free cooling unit. The stuff here is the batteries and the solar panels cover the the top of the, the container to make shade for it uh, so that it doesn't um, heat up. It's highly insulated and so on, but in any case. Um, so, so we got 16 solar panels capable of producing 3 kilowatts of power. Um, we overbuilt the batteries big time, 32 kilowatt hours. Um, is one of the mistakes that we made that I would have purchased less. Um, uh, battery here, but okay. And we connect to the grid too. Uh, but the idea is we only use uh, grid power when uh, renewables are not available, right? Uh, we have two racks, two standard racks in there. And for our, uh, our um, uh, servers, our energy efficient servers, only half you. So we can put in 160 of our servers in there. Right now, we only got 64. Um, and the 64 of them consume just 1.7 kilowatts. Uh, we got two switches, PDUs. So the free cooling has two settings, half speed and, and full speed. At full speed, it consumes uh, 400 watts. So you can see that normally, we're going to be consuming just over 2,000 watts for a 3,000 uh, watt setup. Uh, when the air conditioner kicks in, then we're going to be higher than, than our solar panel capacity. Uh, but we expect that this is uh, too high. We're going to actually consume less than this. And this is going to be, we're going to be very aggressive about uh, energy conservation and consume much less than this. So we expect that over time, we designed the thing to produce roughly 30% to 40% of the total energy of the system, but we expect to go much beyond that and, and go above 50% in terms of drawing from, from solar. Yeah? So the container, how, how much machine you can fit? 
160. 160 servers. How many racks can I fit? Two racks. Two racks. Okay, that's the current uh, design, but how many racks can I fit inside the container in general? Our container, you can't fit more than two because it was designed for two. And, <laughs> and the more space you need, the more dollar you pay. So <laughs> uh, but, but in general, you could build larger installations, right? If, if you think of the Apple system, they got zillions of racks in there, right? So um, am I running too long? Oh, it's off. I forgot. <laughs> No, no, no. This, this is this is watts, right? Not not energy. The sixteen percent is the total energy that you generate, right? Over time, we look at the full year, and you say, if I were producing three kilowatts the whole year, this is my max. How much did I actually produce? Is sixteen percent of that maximum? Yeah, no clouds whatsoever. Yes, and the the sun is at the right spot, right? Okay, I got six more minutes, is that it? Okay, so I'll just show you uh, some quick pictures here. So this is construction, right? Um, you don't see this every day in a CS department, right? With cranes moving around and dropping things in metal frames and stuff like that. Um, so this is under the solar panels, the connection, the, the wiring under it. Um, so this is a picture of the inside of the container. The, the racks are in front of the other because the container is still a mess. People are still working. These are the inverters over here. Uh, so the racks are actually going to be side to side. Um, so you can see here, the, this is the free cooling on one side and the exhaust on the other side. This is a building, by the way. <laughs> oh, actually, here you can see the, the batteries, the free cooling there, the air conditioner, and you can see the, you can see the, the exhaust. The idea is to, is to build a, a channel, right? The air comes from the outside, gets blown into the front of the racks, and come out straight back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So would you still think that the makes the solar power is there? Like in you can. Even though they still can't be yes. So the way it works is that when you're consuming more than the solar panels are producing, mm -hmm. you're going to draw the rest from the grid. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. So you don't have to pay for the gas? No, 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 no. no. We, we'll do that just in terms of research right. when we study systems that are completely off grid. Then, then that's what you have to do. No, this, this is a standard sort of, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in fact, we did all this with support from somebody in mechanical engineering that has sort of collaborated with us. So he says this is the standard design, right? You create a channel for the air and, and you. And we will have partitions too to separate out and, and not allow the air to cross over to parts where there are no machines. So this is the IT equipment. So, so each of these one U things is actually two machines. And this is what's called the, the big server. That's, that's the thing that's going to collect all the metering, all the, the, the monitoring information that we're going to be collecting from. Uh, you know, the, all the servers, the, uh, the inverters, the grid, all of it. Right. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, the software that we're building to, to try and maximize the amount of solar energy that we use. Um, we've produced two systems, um, and we're not very creative with names. So, so one of them is called Green Slot. The other one is called Green Hadoop. We're building a third one that's green something else. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so basically what we did here was to create systems that schedule batch jobs. The nice thing about batch jobs is that they give you this flexibility that allows you to delay when they, they are executed uh, in such a way that you can maximize the amount of green energy that you consume. So the overall approach of these two systems is always the same. So we first predict the amount of green energy that's going to be available into the future. And typically, we look at two days ahead. And we use weather forecasts to, to predict how much electricity is going to be available and, and the pattern of the electricity. Then we schedule the jobs over time, over this window, in such a way that we try to maximize the amount of green energy that gets used thereby minimizing the amount of brown energy that's used. Whenever green energy is not available, then we try to consume cheap brown electricity. Here, we're, we're assuming the on-peak, off-peak pricing that a lot of data centers see. Uh, so whenever we can, if we have to use brown energy, we try to use the cheap kind, not, not the expensive kind, not the on-peak kind. So we may delay jobs to be able to use more green energy, but uh, you've got to do so within constraints of deadlines that are either provided by the user in case of green slot or that we create for ourselves as in green Hadoop, our green Hadoop system. Yeah? Yes. Yes. Uh, I have some results that I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to have time to go over, but uh, we, what we find is that the median error from one hour to two days is always lower than 20% of, of our predictions. So it's not perfect, but it's, it's good enough. And, and so what we do is we'll build systems that are robust to these mispredictions that can quickly readjust. Um, and in, as in Green Hadoop, whenever we, so we decide to turn machines off. Right? Machines that are not used that we can delay and not, uh, that we can turn off and not violate deadlines. We try to turn them off when a green energy is not available, but you may have to take care of data availability. You need to make sure that these machines that are being turned off or, or being sent to sleep are not making data unavailable that will be needed by the jobs that, are, that you are executing. So let me give you a quick view of how one of these systems works. Uh, let's, let's go over a green slot. Uh, and here what I have is our scaling window of two days. This is now. The x-axis on the left, the y-axis on the left, is the number of nodes that we're using. And on the right is the amount of power. Okay? This blue line here is the electricity cost. So notice that the electricity costs less uh, off-peak, which happens to be during the night, right? So electricity is expensive when we have green electricity, right? So this is two sunny days, okay? So uh, now let's say that we want to execute a couple of jobs, job one and job two, and they have deadlines, the same deadline over here, like a little bit more than a day later. And say, you know, job one and job two, then we'll run job one here, job two over there to try and maximize the amount of green energy that we consume, right? We could have run job two right from the beginning here to reduce uh, response time, but we decided to delay it a little bit so that we consume as much green energy as, as we can. So time goes by. Now, notice that our predictions for the future are of much lower green energy, right? Much lower uh, solar energy. And let's say that now we got a couple more uh, jobs to schedule, two jobs that have deadlines two days later. And so we would schedule job three here to use this green energy over here. And job four, instead of running it here, we'll wait because most of it would have to be executed with expensive energy, we wait until the electricity is cheap again and run it there. So as time goes by, 
maybe we realize that we mispredicted. There's actually a lot more green energy than we expected. We thought you know, the day would be terrible, overcast, and so on, but it turns out that it was beautiful. So what we do is we bring job four earlier. We notice that we can, we can run it there and use a lot of green energy here. So we mispredict it, and we're correcting for it. And finally, say there's job five that arrives, and it's very tight with its deadline. So we run it right away and finish right on time. You see the idea here? Yeah, we don't stop jobs and run them later. We could. Uh, that would make the scheduling more complex. You, you mean? What do you choose to do what job? Uh, uh -huh. are, are you looking at the prediction and saying, oh, I'm going to start it then? Or do you have an algorithm to do it? Yeah, no, no. We have an algorithm that, that looks at the scheduling horizon and finds the cheapest slot to put each job. And we order them in terms of deadline, uh, or actually in terms of start time. So the Instead of looking at the deadline, you look at when you have to start to be able to finish at that point. Um, and the way this algorithm works is whenever you have green energy, you make it cost zero. So it will tend to use as much green energy as possible. Right. Right. So there was a question about the accuracy of the predictions. Uh, so like I said, uh, here I'm showing median error. And these are predictions that are this much ahead, one hour, three hours, six hours, and so on. And we're always within 20% for the median error. This is more interesting, actually. This is the predicted and actual predictions. Yeah? What does the median error of 15% mean? The median error of 15%. Um, when you look at all of the days that we've predicted for, and you look at all the errors that you made, you take the median of that. Where you're measuring how many total hours you thought you'd get? Yes. How many you actually get? It, it's the difference between what I thought I would get and what I actually got okay. right, for all of these different predictions that we made. Yes, we haven't collected data from batteries yet. Yeah. So, so these are predictions and actual energy production per hour for the course of one interesting day in June of 2010. Uh, you can see that we're fairly accurate most of the time, but there are three spots where we didn't do so well. Right? Here, the amount of cloud cover was actually less than we thought it would be. So the actual is actually higher than we expected. And here, there was rain that we didn't predict, and a thunderstorm over there that, that we didn't predict. So the predictions are higher than. So, so the way we do the approach, I don't, I don't have time to explain the details here, but we try to correct. We use two different approaches. And every time, we try to figure out which one is more accurate for the current scenario and use that one. So we can correct. And so. When we make a big mistake like this, we switch to the other one, and then we correct that way. This is actually a model extrapolated from the Rutgers Solar Farm. Yeah. So just quickly to show you the behavior of this thing over time. So we ran a green slot on 16 nodes. And this is the, what you see in green here, the green line, is the actual green production of the solar farm scaled down to our size. And, and this workload is one that all the deadlines are spread throughout the week, but you can run it all quickly in the beginning here. So if you looked at an entire week, this would give you roughly a 50% utilization of the cluster. And what Greenslot does is it spreads the execution. You see here that there's a lot of green energy that was not used. 
right? So the brown stuff here is, when you brown energy, it's colored brown here. And when you consume green energy, it's filled with the green, green color. So you can see that there's a lot of brown energy being consumed here. Whereas, and, and not, and, and there's some green energy that's not being used. So green slot sort of spreads this around uh, within the constraint of the, of the deadlines. And so you see that green energy is much more used across the, the week. And when brown energy has to be used, um, so you can see here on Wednesday and Friday, green slot tries to use cheap electricity. So we saved 24% for this particular week um, in terms of cost by increasing the amount of green that we use from 26 kilowatt hours to 38 kilowatt hours, and thereby reducing the amount of brown electricity that we use. So I think I'm going to skip. I got one more slide of results, but I'll skip that. Uh, so here are some of the, the works that we're doing now. We're looking at sort of a map of the world and trying to figure out where to place a network of data centers to achieve a certain amount of, constantly achieve a certain amount of power out of renewables with some probability. So I'd like to have a 90% or whatever the number is, 90% chance that I'll find 10 megawatts in my network of data centers just out of solar and wind. So we're, we're doing some stuff there. Uh, we're creating this new system called Green Nebula, which is a modification of the Open Nebula cloud system to uh, sort of accept virtual machines that get submitted to our system and perhaps move them across data centers that have, that have renewables. Another interesting thing is that uh, we're, we're studying the trade-off between performance and green energy use by perhaps delaying certain things that can improve performance until green energy is available, for example, compaction of data. Right? Uh, so, so, so maintenance tasks in real systems, when we postpone them, typically there's a, a performance penalty. But the advantage is that that extra um, maintenance task doesn't run when green energy is not available. So we use green energy to run them. So and most of the work really, despite all of this, is going to be in setting up and making Parasol actually run. Um, so just concluding, um, we think this topic is really exciting. It has societal impact. It's sort of sexy, right, in a sense. Um, but there's a lot to do, and there's a lot that we don't have answers for, right? We're this topic in such an infancy that everything is wide open. Out of those four approaches, which one is going to be the best? Nobody knows. How well Parasol is going to do? Nobody knows. So it's it's really exciting to be doing this this kind of stuff now. And what we're trying to do is talk to people and have them start working on this too, and uh, maybe exchange ideas and so on. Um, thank you all for coming. This is basically all I had to say. Um, and I'd be happy to answer questions if you have any. Yeah. Just to point your attention that there is a conflict of interest between some of our approaches and your approach. And one of you is <laughs> Okay, yeah. Very clear in the center of the Yeah. Okay. Some of us are trying to use photonics to reduce the, to, to increase the energy efficiency. And to use photonics with wimpy servers makes no sense. The, the, the photonics works best if it's a hefty server. Right. High performance, big and iron. And then you can have optics go in and become more efficient and mm. scale mm -hmm. uh, economy of scale or whatever. Right, right. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. How would you, do you see any worries about battery efficiency and have computation that's customer facing? The, 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 to have computation what? That's customer facing with plasma, how many seconds? 
Uh, no. If anything that, that has interactive requirements cannot run off the grid. Oh, with these integrities? Can't no. Okay. Because you have to recharge the batteries, correct? The problem is that with renewables, you know, what if you go a week without wind? You could, you could size your battery so that it's highly unlikely that you go so long without wind. But even if you don't go so long, the amount of wind that's there is only, let's say it's only enough to run what you have at the moment. It, 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 it can, it's very difficult to make a guarantee unless you have a network like what we're going to do. Yeah, he's, he's saying, what if I don't have a connection at all, right? No, it, it depends, right? If, if you have interactive, uh, interactive workloads, you can do things like degrade uh, quality, as you know, people at Berkeley are doing. Right? When green is not available, you degrade the quality a little bit so that you don't consume as much brown energy. When green is available, then you bring the quality up. So these are things that, that people are looking at. Another, another example may be, um, Maybe you can try and postpone things to the limit when green is not there so that in the hopes that green will, more green will be there or so that you discharge your batteries more slowly. Right? You can, you can play those tricks. Um, so I, I wouldn't say it's just batch jobs. Batch jobs are the low-hanging fruit in a sense. Thank you guys.